It is the year 2472, and the Earth has suffered a great calamity. Hundreds of years of popular culture have vanished. Without the sacred films and texts for guidance, civilization is devoid of anything cool. Then, three incubation chambers are unearthed. And from within, men from the time of the great blockbusters emerge. Now, through highly interesting conversations, they share invaluable insight about what once was. The movies, the shows, the comics, toys, and books. This is... The Hyperspace. Podcasting in the 25th century. Welcome in, podcast pioneers, to the Hyperspace. Podcasting in the 25th century. The interweb's first... And only podcast. As far as you know. As far as I know. My name is Jared. And I'm Matt. And I'm Mike. Or Michael. Michael. Hello, Michael. <laughs> Dude, you know, you should make your car talk to you like that. Hello, Michael. If you had a kit in your car, oh, that would be awesome. I remember, I don't know, I guess it was about 10 years ago, you could, like, have your TomTom GPS. Remember GPS devices? I do remember that. Oh, yeah. You could have your TomTom GPS speak to you in Kit's voice. I remember riding with you and had Darth Vader talking to you. Yes. There were actually some... The longest possible (laughs) route. I'm like, where are we? (laughs) Listen, I'm just listening to Darth Vader, okay? There's some really uh, funny YouTube videos of Darth Vader recording for Tom Tom, like he's in a sound that. booth, <laughs> and he's he can't say roundabout. He says roundabound, and <laughs> no, the the that, engineer yeah. gets irritated with him. Oh, roundabound, roundabound, and he starts choking the engineer. It was pretty funny. Darth Vader, Tom Tom GPS. Look it up on YouTube. Yeah, it's a classic. Please take the third exit on the roundabout. It's roundabout. Correct. <sighs> roundabout. You're saying roundabout. It's roundabout. Is there any way you can make it sound a little less depressing? <sighs> exit right ahead. Don't force it. Just make it sound natural. You should have seen his face when I told him I was his father. <sighs> I told my son, who did not know that I was his father, that I was his father. Yeah, and she, there's a twin sister involved. Ah. Here it is. Whoa, 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 whoa. Roundabout. You know, speaking of Star Wars, you've got a little update on the new Star Wars box set that came out. You picked that up. So I'm curious to, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. But before we get to Star Wars, you know, on this podcast, we do a lot of Star Wars, and for good reason. But something we don't do that much of, which we should be doing a lot more of, is Star Trek. This episode, we're going to talk about some of our favorite Star Trek episodes from the original series. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, yes. But, I uh, can't wait. We, ha- we, have, we have neglected Star Trek on this show. Shame I know. on us. Shame on us. But that ends. That ends today. But before we get to uh, Star Trek, I want to hear about the box set. All right, let's talk about another star franchise, Star Search. (laughs) When Ed McMahon, no. Uh, I went to Best Buy last week and did the curbside pickup, which is the only way you can shop at Best Buy these days. I also utilized the curbside pickup when I got a new TV. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's like going to McDonald's, (laughs) except you're not picking up food. (laughs) Like, I'll have one of those Star Wars box sets, please. Oh yeah, sure thing. Anyway, it's a it's a great looking box set. It looks very nice on my shelf. But I've been digging into some of the extras on the discs. And uh not to mention the um uh, it came with digital codes, which I know they're all on Disney Plus now, but it's kind of nice to have them in my uh, movies anywhere library. Uh, where I can access pretty much most of the disc-based special features, which makes it very easy to go through them. As we had talked about briefly, I think most of the stuff has appeared elsewhere, 
But there are some things that I had not seen before. They created about an hour's worth of new stuff for the digital release of episodes one through six uh, in 2015. They, they put them out digitally. Like you, for the first time, you could buy them digitally. But they did create about an hour's worth of new stuff. I had not seen this, this new stuff before, and it's quite good. Now, is it an hour for each movie or an hour total? No, no, it's an hour total. They break it up into uh, anywhere between 10 and 15 minute segments. Okay, so what kind of stuff do they have? It's a bunch of the old timers. It's like a round table setting. Uh, sometimes it's like sound designers, Matt Wood and Ben Burt just having a conversation. And the, the best one so far has been the the visual effects discussion where Dennis Murin and Phil Tippett from the original trilogy are talking to John Knoll and Roger Guyette. And John Knoll did the prequels, Roger Guyette did the sequels. So it's like four of these guys sitting around talking and just kind of sharing memories and stuff. It's it's really it's really interesting stuff. But there was a new piece of trivia that I had never heard before that I actually picked up uh, in one of these little featurettes. And I'd like to really? share it. Yes. It was a new nugget I'd never heard. So Ben Burt, of course, is the genius who created the sound of Star Wars. Like every iconic sound that you can think of from Star Wars, he created it. So in his segment, he was talking about how he would go out and capture sounds. And one thing he really wanted to do was visit this guy's house who had all the old um, like electronic machinery that was used in the movie Frankenstein, the, the original Boris Karloff Frankenstein. Oh, it's, wow. This guy still had all the stuff that was used in that movie, and it still worked, you know, like all the arcing, you know, like electrical sounds, and so it made all the, the sparks and everything, which they actually did use that stuff in um, Young Frankenstein many years later. Anyway, the guy who owned this stuff, Ben Burt went to see him, before the first Star Wars came out, wanting to record the, those machines being fired up. And the guy wouldn't let him do it. But after Star Wars came out, this this old guy who owned the machinery went and saw Star Wars and was like, the next day, like calling Ben Burt going, yeah, come over and record my stuff. You can use it in the next Star Wars movie, please. Oh. <laughs> ben so, said, forget you, buddy. You had your <laughs> no. chance. Ben Burt went over and he saw all this old machinery that was used in Frankenstein, and he fired it up, and he recorded it. And it wasn't used until the return of the Jedi, when the Emperor is shocking Luke. So the sounds of the Emperor frying Luke are from the machines that made Frankenstein. Wow, that is awesome. Yeah, which I thought that was a cool little bit of movie trivia, that, you know, Frankenstein's... Machines are the sound of Palpatine's lightning. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's something I had never heard, ever. That's so, pretty amazing that that's been in the background this entire time. I can't yeah. believe that's, that hasn't gotten out like that. No, no. And I, you know, just watching this little this little feature, I, I that's something I picked up that I'd never heard before. But anyway, it's uh, it's been fun going through that stuff and seeing things that I had not seen because I didn't spring for the digital versions because they were I don't know they were pretty expensive as far as digital movie releases go like so I thought 20 bucks each yeah which is pretty outrageous but yeah it was cool to uh it was cool to see them so I'm also almost uh halfway through the Rise of Skywalker novelization it's pretty good there are some tidbits which we can talk about later but I haven't really got to the meaty stuff yet like the stuff uh, at the end with Palpatine. So my work schedule is pretty crazy, so I'm not getting able to read as much as I'd like. But anyway, that's uh, that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I almost want to buy physical media right now. No, you don't. You just have me tell no. you about it. I'm just, I'd am just. i rather you just tell me about it and I'll just watch it on like Disney+. Plus. It'll be on YouTube in like two YouTube. days anyway, Come so on. don't worry about it. I still might buy the box set down the road. You never know. I'm on the fence, but... 
Before we get to our Star Trek episodes, I think we should warp into some random space. Let's go. Random access memory. All right, it's time for our random access memory. We're going to get a little random here. Guys, I'm just curious, actually. You know, we're all sci-fi fans here. And of course, Speak like, for yourself. Thanks. <laughs> the big heavy hitters are no-brainers, but I'm just curious. What are some, like, guilty pleasure sci-fi movies? You know, some like, what's some good B-movies, sci-fi stuff that you guys like? Well, I mean, Flash Gordon is a... You know, no brainer. Yeah, but you know, I think Flash Gordon transcends the B movies. It's such a, it's it's such a hyper cult classic. I don't ah. know if it's. <laughs> but but Flash Gordon, man, Flash Gordon is. Uh, a he'll classic. save every one of us, Flash. Man, he's, he's the best. Yeah, I, I thought about Flash Gordon initially too, but I think you're right. It is. It has kind of uh, gained this this popularity in the past. You know, twenty thirty years. Well, here's one that has okay. it. Okay. Black Hole. I love The Black Hole. Such a good movie. Yes. I just recently saw that again thanks to Disney Plus. Yeah, I did, I did as well. I think uh I think it's good. I don't I think like the middle of the movie seems to be missing. <laughs> it's just sort of like Oh, we're going to the Black Hole. Wait, what? <laughs> but uh, it feels though that it's a it's a it's a movie that's caught in between epochs of technology. It's, I, I really feel that that movie probably was made about five years too early with Disney because Disney was still caught up in some of its old tricks that they were trying to put into that forward-thinking movie. And uh, it just it just dates the movie too much for me. No idea the, what you're the, talking about. The robots specifically are, you know, the the... What are their names? The the Vincent two. Vincent and Bob. Yeah, Vincent and Bob are the 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 two things that really hold that movie back for me. Really, I I like their design, but I think the one thing that kind of makes me laugh if you look at it from a because the movie's kind of like hard sci-fi. That's and that's what I mean. It, it's and but it's, then you have these robots thinking. where they program their pupils to yeah. move around. <laughs> it's sort of like well, that seems like kind of a strange thing to do yeah. for a robot. It just doesn't. It just doesn't have that that hard edge of sci-fi that the rest of the movie has, which is a legitimate, really fascinating, spooky movie. I mean, it's it's yeah. a John Barry score is really yeah, it's like, fantastic. Yeah, the, the overture is fantastic, but man, Black Hole's great. <laughs> the only problem with it though is uh, he doesn't like he has that theme and he hangs with it. <laughs> Yeah, like, that's <laughs> yeah, the whole five, movie. Five minutes of like everything is a heroic na, 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 action na, na, in that movie. Na, 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 na. It's like okay, <laughs> something different. Uh, good movie, creepy, creepy guy in, through, <laughs> and beyond. Well, Maximilian Schnell, Shell was his yes, name. Yes, uh, he, he, he was, was a weirdo. He was great. I like when he bonks his head. <laughs> when he's like frustrated, he bonks his head. So weird, <laughs> so good. And it's pretty dark, especially for like a six or seven year old. Yeah, and you don't really understand anything that's going on in the last like five minutes of the movie. When, when what's her face takes that thing off that poor schmuck's face and that zombie, <laughs> yes, under there. Yeah, you're like, was, what the hell? That was that was a little freakish. Black hole's a good choice. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna go with one that we've talked about a little bit. For me, is uh, Logan's Run, another classic, and it. it's because you know I think watching that with Mike on his thirtieth birthday, in, at, where he would have been renewed had he been living in the movie, uh, <laughs> was kind of a, a memorable experience for me. But the movie is uh, it's not good. <laughs> Um, it's it's just campy. Yeah, and time stamp. You get the Peter Ustinov living with all his cats, and then the Burl <laughs> Ives robot, and let's take off our clothes before they freeze to us. I have to try Box. to find sometime. <laughs> Come on, let's let's take off our clothes before they freeze to us, and we'll I'm be face naked. the camera this way when you do it. <laughs> oh, 
Oh man, I love Logan's Run though. Such a such a campy classic. It's a lot like uh, Zardoz. It has that that time <laughs> stamp of the the late sixties, kind of like early seventies. Yes, flower power, like free love hippie kind of vibe to it. That it just prevailed and made it. You know, and I I think all awful and great at the same time. All sci fi movies from the late sixties to the mid 70s they kind of have that same sheen on them you know there's just a look about them that is consistent when you get to star wars they did something different it's like you watch those old sci-fi movies and everything's like all clean yes everything in the future is supposed to be so you know uh, sterile and clean and then you know and then star Star wars Wars, yeah it was like everything's dirty and and then up. you know right after that was uh alien and it's sort of the same yeah it's the, the same, same exactly aesthetic the same. but yeah truckers and, but, in space but if you look at some of the effects uh, i think logan's run was 76 uh, i think maybe when it came out it's just amazing looking at some of those visual effects like the the shots of the cityscapes and the little monorails and the tubes and stuff it just looks so fake. Like, <laughs> not even... It's like, you know, they didn't even try. And you're thinking, man, a year later, Star Wars is coming out. And it just shows you what a, like, a just a leap forward that Star Wars was. Yeah, true. I mean, Logan's Run was, was still carrying over a style. It was stylistic for the last, you know, a decade of that look. Yes. You know, agreed. they weren't trying to be... They weren't trying to break any new grounds with that movie. They were just taking kind of what was already existing and just telling a new story with it. Yeah, and it was probably one of the last like big sci-fi movies that that had the look of that era. Oh yeah, how could you go back after Star Wars? No, you can't. Everything you can't. So, what about you, Matt? I was thinking of of different movies the other night, and I saw Peter Weller. I was slipping through, and I saw like on the History Channel, and Peter Weller had like a, a series on there and i remember thinking oh man he was in that movie from like the mid 90s i think it went straight to video it was called uh screamers i think i mentioned it to you guys before yeah and, uh, have you guys ever seen screamers no i've never I've, seen it i know what you're talking about i've never seen it y- y- screamers is kind of i guess it i kinda, remember it was in the theater i remember was Hall's it i i don't cinematic. remember it at all but but it, that was in college i don't think it was moment. there very long i can't imagine it was but screamers is actually a a pretty solid, pretty solid movie. And if it wasn't for Peter Weller, you, it would it'd be unwatchable. But Peter Weller brings a lot of credibility to the movie. And it's about uh, not too distant future where two corporate factions have been at war with each other for a long time. And each has, you know, their their armies and whatnot. And I guess what we do, we, we pick up with Peter Weller in uh, a bunker on, so I forget the planet that he's on. And they've been in this bunker for like years waiting for an attack and they haven't had any communication for years uh, with whatever faction they belong to. So they've just been kind of like standing guard. And the other faction had been manufacturing uh, like robots or whatnot, uh, technology to kill. And nobody's heard from the other faction on this planet either. So everyone's kind of in the dark. And what the screamers are, are if, uh, they're like little underground saw blades that will just kill you if you if you're walking and you don't have like a special disruptor the emitter on you uh, the screamers come and get you and I, I guess they're like prolific all over the planet so you have to just be careful or else these little underground robot saw blades will come and cut you to pieces and it just progresses through the the mystery of what happened to the other faction why are all these robots on the planet and what becomes of peter weller and his crew and it sounds it sounds very hokey, and it kind of is, but it actually is a pretty watchable, pretty fun movie to watch. It's pretty good, but uh, but Peter Weller, if you're a Peter Weller fan, this is a it's a it's a good movie, and it's actually a pretty well written piece of sci fi. It's just it's not super high budget, but it's not the lowest budget either. It's right in the middle, so I I recommend one watch. Huh? Good random sci fi out there that exists that most people don't know about. All right, so that's enough of talking about movies that nobody watches. I think we should talk about something a lot of people have watched and enjoyed for many years. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. 
its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. One of the first shows I ever remember watching as a little kid was Star Trek. It came on once a week on reruns, and it was one of the few shows that my parents would let me watch with them before I went to bed. And Star Trek became one of my favorite shows of all time, and one of my best memories of being a little kid. What day of the week was it on? I have no, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember, but I, but I, uh, I'll tell you a funny story uh, when I when we start talking about the episodes about the the quirkiness of how my parents let me watch TV back then. I think I mentioned it before on the podcast, but but yeah, my mom was really into sci-fi. My mom read a lot of of uh, sci-fi growing up. She's a big Anne Rand fan. She likes uh, Heinlein. She's you know, and it just kind of translated into uh, into Star Trek. And when Star Trek came on, originally my mom was a big fan when it premiered. And then luckily it was on reruns when I was a little kid. So I was probably, I don't know, four years old when I remember watching it. And the first episode I'm going to talk about was the first episode I ever remember watching of Star Trek. And that was Arena. Yes. With the Gorn. With the Gorn. Now, arguably not the best Star Trek episode, but one of my personal favorites, just because it's the very first image of Star Trek that I can remember in my life. And I always like seeing that episode pop back in. You know, if I catch it, I, you know, I'm like, hey, look, there he is, the Gorn, wandering around in his ridiculous reptile suit. <laughs> like just but, lumbering around very slowly, easily escapable. Uh, <laughs> I saw a commercial with, with Kirk and the Gorn not long ago oh, uh, with William Shatner. <laughs> It made me laugh. <laughs> yes. That was really good. That was that commercial was better than the video game it was advertising. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was slightly better than the episode that, that it's from, too. Uh it was great. But if uh but Arena was about Kirk being uh, chosen to to battle for I forgot what the names of the beings were. The Metrons. Is it the Metrons? Yes. And uh, he was pitted against the Gorn, and he was uh, he had to figure out almost like a really bad video game all the different elements. This planet is a mineral gold mine. <laughs> yes, a and fortune and a fortune and diamonds. Uh, f- fortune. Yet I Wasted. would. Tr- yet I would trade them all <laughs> for a phaser <laughs> or a nice solid club. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so Kirk is being pursued by this reptilian uh, caveman Gorn. And he winds up taking the elements and minerals from the local uh, rock and stuffing them into like some tree husk like and a using bamboo like a husk. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but that, but I always enjoyed that episode a lot. I always thought that was pretty cool. And that episode featured. Um, I, there's a name of the rock that they were climbing on, but we've seen this rock in countless movies, from Bill, Bill and Ted to uh, even in the new Picard series. Uh, we see that rock make an appearance. It's become a staple of Star Trek from this one episode. Vasquez rocks. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So arena, definitely one of my favorites. When I watched this episode, like every other thing I watched when I was four years old, I had no idea how it ended ever. (laughs) But because you had to go to bed. That's right. Ever. (laughs) So my parents would let me watch about 45 minutes of the program until that last break pod hit. And then I had to go to bed. And I don't know what kind of weird, torturous what the thing heck? they were doing with us. Yeah. N- never, ever let me finish something. You couldn't I mean, wait 10 more minutes? No. I, no. I, I just, you know what? They, I just next week, they were back in the Enterprise, and I just assumed everything turned out okay. Well, I guess they made it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, well, okay. But that's that's how it was. I, it Kirk was always the climax of the nice action. new green shoes. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like I, I never got to see the resolution of any of these episodes as a kid. So Man. I, uh, I just assumed that everything turned out okay. How did you not raise holy hell when they said, go to bed? I don't remember. You're like, what? Because well, they would have spanked them. Yeah, I guess. But <laughs> Back man. in the old days when they spanked <laughs> kids. Man. Okay. Uh, I'll have to ask my parents to see what they're thinking. I'll get back to the podcast on that. Okay. 
Why did you not let them watch the last <laughs> 10 minutes of any Star Trek episode? Oh, they'll deny it, too. I know they'll be like, no, we let you watch everything. No, you didn't. <laughs> I remember. I know you didn't. It's well, so, so Matt, in case you don't know, it ends with Kirk showing mercy yeah. to the Gorn. <laughs> I, I, I have seen Arena since. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, that's good. Mike, do you want to go next? So, you know, I've... I've seen all the original episodes, and so my list is compiled on the ones that that I think really stand up as really strong episodes for whatever reason. And the one I've picked is um, the one I really like is Balance of Terror. That's a good I think one. That's, yeah, I think it's really smart. And, you know, so for, you know it's always funny because, you know, you think of the Klingons as the staple Star Trek villains, but it was the Romulans that they encountered first. That's true. You know, it was an interesting setup because obviously what they're building towards is, I guess, a f- racism with Spock. But you know, they had the first in- ca- they'd had encountered the Romulans before, but they this before they had view screens. This encounter that the Enterprise has with them is the first time they can see him, and of course, they look like Vulcans. Mm-hmm. And of course, everyone hates Spock. But um, anyway, it's <laughs> yeah, just it was, a, it's, it's a, as subtle it's as like, a sledgehammer. Yeah, it's so, like uh, I, seriously, dude, how did you? <laughs> That guy was just like, why don't you ask Spock? He probably knows. <laughs> you know, for years, though, his name was, that act that the uh, character's name was Styles. Yes. And I always thought for some reason that that was the same Styles as the captain, uh, of, the Excel- captain of the Excelsior, yeah. Yeah. Which it, I guess it turned out not to be, but it would have been a good, yeah. good bridge over. They're both kind of, you know, pricks. <laughs> it would explain why... Uh, Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That would be kind of interesting. Anyway, so, um, but of course, it's a take on the old, like, submarine uh, running silent, running deep type yeah, thing. Yeah, because they had the cloaking device. Yeah, but uh, I always liked that. I mean, that was, like, a really good episode. And um, years later, when they they redid uh, the effects, because when they started redoing the special effects, they would redo the shots, like, shot for shot. So Balance of Terror was one where the the, the updated uh, CG was done pretty much like uh, like it was done on the original episode. Uh-huh. But of course, as that went on, they started to get more creative with it. And like, yes, yeah, Balance of Terror was the first remastered episode released. It was the first one they did. So the shots don't while while they look great, they're not very exciting because they're still following the original shots that were in the original episode but yeah I, that's i always kind of hate it that that was because what they because they you know like later on they they were they started going nuts with those shots and it was really cool but uh that one is unfortunately flat but still it's like a it's like one of the great episodes of star trek yeah I think. that's the first time we got to see a, a romulan warbird mm-hmm. in in the show and you know in picard recently uh they kind of went back to that that design very very close to that design of the original series. Yes, with the uh, with the Romulan warbirds also. Yeah, I'll so. tell you another thing I too I liked about that episode is how they kept like contacting those bases, the star <laughs> bases, being, and they were just being be... destroyed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, it, it, it was a it was a, it had some interesting tension in the episode. Whoa. It was a good episode. And the Enterprise, can you hear me, Enterprise? <laughs> the, the guy and. He's just sitting in an office that's on fire, and he's all disheveled. And and then, and then when he he looks up to the sky, I know he looks up, and then he gets blown up, and he sort of stands up, and it arches his back like. "Ah!" (laughs) But we had uh, we had Mark Leonard as the main Romulan commander, who would later, of course, become famous as Sarek. Spock used uh, everyone back then. I also like the music. From that episode, they, they kind of have the Romulan. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's. Uh... Balance of Terror is is a great episode, and I'm going to talk about one right now that we are all familiar with uh, because of the infamous Clint Howard. 
<laughs> I am Baylock. Welcome aboard. Corbo might maneuver. This one, man, I tell you, I don't remember when I first saw this, but I do remember that the Baylock puppet really freaked me out as a child <laughs> when they saw him at first on the view screen. Uh, when they were like, Spock, do you think you can get a picture inside the ship? And then they, they get that blurry picture of the terrifying Baylock puppet. Um, of course, the episode uh, revolves around the Enterprise coming into contact with this uh, this giant ship called the Vasarius. This is the Vasarius. And <laughs> oh, it, and you know whose voice that is? That's uh, Lurch. Ted Cassidy. Yep. That's old Ted Cassidy. We give you one Earth minute to pray to whatever gods you may have. Um, the whole episode revolves around Kirk trying to bluff his way out of destruction because this gigantic ship has captured them and is, you know, basically saying, uh, "You're gonna, we're gonna destroy you." The or the whole show is about like him playing poker with this person. Uh, he's he's trying to bluff his way out of it, which Kirk Kirk would do many times in the original series. Kirk had a way, I've heard it called verbal jujitsu, where Kirk can basically when he you know he can talk a computer into killing itself, and you know he just he he has all these great Kirk speeches where he just he he makes every uh, evil person uh, doubt themselves and ultimately destroy themselves <laughs> so he convinces Baylock that um if if he destroys the enterprise they have something on the the ship called corbomite which will also destroy the Viserys, hoping that that bluff will work and uh, ultimately spoiler alert it does but also at the same time he's having to deal with that friggin with that head case who was on the bridge oh with him. Oh, my God. Like, can't you feel <laughs> what you're human? <laughs> what are you all out of your minds? End of watch. It's the end of everything. What are you, robots? Wound up toy soldiers. Don't you know when you're dying? Dude, okay. I, I'm just, I, here's what I would say. I think maybe if you're in the 23rd century and you're on a starship, there may be more rigorous psychological testing done before certain people are allowed to be part of the crew. Listen, um, okay, so Mr. Bailey, what we're going to do now, we're going to put you through this simulation where you're in a haunted house, and we're going to see how you do. Okay, here you go, Mr. Bailey. Simulation begins. Here comes a ghost. Oh, my God! What is that? Help! Okay. Perfect. Navigator. <laughs> okay, Let's yeah. Put him on the bridge. All right, sign him up. He's good to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing, you know, the original show, it painted in very broad strokes and um, sometimes was as subtle as a sledgehammer. But, yeah, Bailey was a – I don't remember the actor's name, but he was a great – he was a great freak out guy. He was just. I always he was a thought he looked like the guy that played the professor. I thought for sure that was the guy that played the professor, but it wasn't. No, but he, you're right. He he does look like the professor from Gilligan's Island. But yeah, that guy. And ultimately, Kirk does the right thing and dumps him off with a Baylock. <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, <laughs> just stay here with the kid. He goes. I he got goes, the perfect guy ah. for you. <laughs> he goes. Do you know anyone who would like to stay here, Mister Bailey? <laughs> Well, uh, I would, sir. And you know, Bailey's like, well, I, I, all my stuff, I, not really. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So he dumped off Mr. Bailey with young, frightening Clint Howard. <laughs> and uh, no, well, so Baylock, the whole thing is, uh, Baylock is this little childlike alien with a, it's with Clint Howard. Eyebrows. Yeah. It's Clint Howard dubbed with this a very odd voice. I'm Baylock. Welcome aboard. Sit. Be comfortable. So the whole thing is like he's controlling this puppet and he's not menacing at all. He's just this little guy and he offers them a drink called Tranya, which is infamous now. We must drink. This is Tranya. 
I hope you relish it as much as I. I like oh, when he, Let me show you my I ship, hope you Captain. Re- and just <laughs> hope you walking relish around it. these curtains. Yeah. yeah. I hope you relish it. Yeah. Okay. Come and explore this set. <laughs> There are many shimmering curtains here. Uh, I hope you relish it as much as I. And he has a laugh. Oh, the laugh. Oh, the laugh's getting dubbed in. There's no way it's not. (laughs) Somebody on YouTube has looped that laugh for 10 hours. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) What? It is. It's completely amazing. But anyway. That must be maddening. Oh, but anyway, Corbo might maneuver. That's That's a fun one I've... I've taken enough time. Uh, my next one, I'm going to pick a Doomsday Machine. Yeah, that's Doomsday a good one. Machine. Oh, that's big. a fantastic uh, one. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was the first time we saw another Starfleet starship. Another Constitution-class vessel? Yeah, it was the Constellation that I think Matt Decker was commanding. And uh, So the Doomsday son. Machine would be in the motion picture. Now, is it supposed to be his son? I believe it is. It is, yes. Because Will, okay. William Decker is Commodore Matt Decker's, Decker's son. son. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Um, his, his father was a lunatic. Uh, <laughs> so the, the plot in Doomsday Machine is Matt Decker, the Commodore Decker, is uh, in charge of the... He's in, he's in command of the Constellation, which is a uh, like a sister ship to the Enterprise. And they discover this ancient machine that looks like a giant slug out in space that uh it's a funnel it's a big giant it, funnel. it's like a big a giant big funnel that shoots uh, <clears throat> nasty beams out and destroys everything and he winds up dumping his crew on a planet <laughs> to try and take on this machine but the the doomsday machine blows the planet up with all his crew <laughs> so he kind of he kind of gets a little upset a little he kind of loses his mind a little so uh when kirk and the enterprise arrive <clears throat> decker is trying to uh you know, commandeer the Enterprise and, and basically find a way to destroy the machine. If we just both ships go into it and blow it up. But, uh, well, there's a great, think, it's great because Kirk is on the other, he, cause he, he ends up being on the, the, what's the name of the ship? Constellation. The Constellation. He's on that ship watching I, Decker <laughs> trying take to take the Enterprise <laughs> against this doomsday. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, he's like, whoa, 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 wait, what, what? <laughs> and that actor, uh, oh, uh, his name is William stuff. Wyndham. Wyndham. I just sent um, a picture to the chain. Yeah, uh, you guys okay. will like. He's kind of like that old-fashioned, like, uh, like Western TV actor <laughs> who's been around in like a, and you just see him in this. And he's all, he's grizzled. Yes, <laughs> he looks like. Yeah, but when he takes over the bridge, he's all being all cocky, but yeah. it's weird because he's got like a five o'clock shadow and <laughs> yeah. his hair is a mess, <laughs> and he's like. Being a real arrogant. I know he's like, Mr. Spock, you will do as you are told, or you will be escorted from the bridge. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I I like that episode a lot. Whenever Doomsday Machine came on and I could catch that, I was always excited to see that one. Um, I always wanted to know more. In fact, I thought they were going to try to make Star Trek IV a tie-in to the Doomsday Machine. Yeah. because it looks similar that probe. Right when I Maybe when I was a kid, that's what it, the probe was going to call in because there were no whales <laughs> calling its older brother. <laughs> but I when I, I remember when I saw the preview for Star Trek Four, I remember thinking, "Wow, is is that going to be a Doomsday Machine?" Also, and of course, it's not. It's just a it's a whale pool or whatever they're doing there. Yeah, but uh, that's... I wanted to, I always wanted to know more about the Doomsday Machine. But you know, you never get that answer. No, you never get it, and I think give it to you. Sometimes well, you don't need to know. Well, yeah, I think you know there are about seven hundred and ninety Star Trek novels, <clears throat> yeah. and I think of, of I think one or two of them uh, kind of dips into that. Uh, where the, the sure Doomsday Machine, but well, one thing I'll say about that episode is that was one of the ones where I talked about previously that they when they updated the effects, they really played with it and did some really cool stuff with it. Yes. Like you see some great shots of the Enterprise flying over the Doomsday, Doomsday Machine and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a, they really... That was a really exciting one to watch. They spruced it up. And um, the picture that I sent to the group, that that actual picture is on a, a t-shirt that says, There was, but not anymore! <laughs> <laughs> it's a great picture that's going on that. That's going up on social media. <laughs> yeah. 
They say there's no devil, Jim. But there is a... Right out of hell, I saw it! Matt, where's your crew? On the third planet. There is no third planet. Don't you think I know that? There was, but not anymore. All right, who is next? Uh, me. Go for it. Uh, my next one is uh, What Are Little Girls Made Of? I like that oh. episode a lot. First of uh, all, it's got I bet you I know why. <laughs> super hot <laughs> Sherry Jackson in it. Who looks unbelievably amazing in it. Um, yeah. But also, it's got a, like, a really cool story with a great twist ending. Um, it had a scene that, when I saw it as a kid, completely freaked me out. But before we get there, I want to talk about, um, you know, I guess a quick synopsis is Kurt, the Enterprise goes to this planet. There's a, they make contact with the doctor. I can't remember the name of the doctor. Dr. He, Corby. He was, Corby was... Um, Chapel's, I guess, fiance. Yes. And they thought he was dead, so they go to the planet. They find him. He's all healthy, living with like a giant uh, Ted Cassidy. <laughs> yes, Lurch and and uh, Sherry Rook. Jackson. And uh, turns out they're robots. And anyway, uh, the the ending is great because it turns out that Doctor Corby himself is a robot and there's this it's this great scene that's the thing about star trek it was really good writing and had some really good performances but the thing that happened that really freaked me out when i was a kid is when they find out he's a robot because his hand gets caught in the door yes and he pulls his hand he's got this flap of skin yes (laughs) oh yeah that's right (laughs) hanging on his hand oh my gosh i saw this kid and i was like oh my it was like and, horrifying and christine chapel is completely mortified and he's like yeah, holding he's, it out going it's it's okay it's still yeah. me. it's okay <laughs> but uh and i love the way they made the robots like they just put uh a, this i don't know like, like a, this like play-doh a, this goo like yeah, like a dummy that they use for karate to yeah punch on <laughs> but it's and they just spin it around and then it's um it and then, into, like, and it, yeah, you have to put the person you're copying on the other side, <laughs> right, on and, that little and, centrifuge. Thing yeah, and it spins. And there were two Kirks at one time. There was, yeah, there's some great stuff with the two Kirks. But uh, my favorite <laughs> thing about that episode is when uh, Kirk gets away and he's <laughs> running through the caves. Oh no! And uh, I know. And oh, I know. <laughs> Ruck is chasing him, and he pulls this stalactite. It's famous. <laughs> And the the caves are pink, and so he pulls off this stalactite, and he's standing there holding this thing, and man, it looks like <laughs> looks like a penis, like a giant penis. I, I just can't believe, like when they were shooting that scene, that somebody who didn't go, "Hey, ah, uh, am am I the only one seeing this?" Because <laughs> it's clearly <laughs> there's there's absolutely no question. <laughs> What this is. You know, it's got the mushroom tip and everything. <laughs> and you know, Shatner's standing there in that picture. He's like, yeah, yeah, take a picture of the, this. The way the lighting hits the top of it, it's, yeah. just, it's bad. It's all bad. <laughs> that was uh, that was a good episode. Yeah. But, but aside it, from that, I mean, it's still like a really good episode. Yeah. And uh, the caves are obviously styrofoam, which was part of that show's charm, really. I mean, because oh, some yeah, of the, the some of the were... some of the sets were really you know low rent, but again, it's part of the charm. You know, I'm glad I grew up with it because you know, ki- kids nowadays would just laugh at that. So, although my daughter was really like Star Trek about two years ago, she found it on Netflix and she just like was watching it all the time. I was like, really? Oh, wow! Holy oh, yeah. cow! Oh, good. So moving on, I'm going to talk about. An episode that's not so famous. It's from season three, and it is called the Cloud Minders. And oh, wow, that's an obscure one. Yeah, it's not, and it's not even that. I mean, it's not a super great episode or anything. But the reason it's significant to me is that when I was growing up, the first the first episode I ever saw was Devil in the Dark, with with the Horda, and. Obviously, that that's that's memorable because people are being chased by a giant pepperoni pizza. 
<laughs> and you know it was I love, I, yeah. I love that episode it's yeah. one of my favorites oh it's a good one I like it too but it, it made an impression because obviously it's like um, it's it's just memorable the, the design of the creature and everything but um, I I really got into Star Trek with the films uh, Star Trek 3 was the first one I saw in a theater and uh, so after Star Trek 3 the TV series was no longer playing in the Knoxville area in syndication. And it was like one, I, you know, after Star Trek three, I was all in for Star Trek. I was like, I love Star Trek. I started, you know, getting books and everything, but it wasn't on TV in where I lived. So we were visiting family in uh, Illinois that year. And my uncle had a, VCR and Star Trek was playing there in Illinois in syndication. And while I was there, I managed to record one episode of Star Trek, the cloud minders. So I had this VHS tape with the cloud minders on it for about a year. And it was the only Star Trek episode I had like that I could watch whenever I wanted to because like I said it wasn't available in Knoxville at that time so I watched that tape until it wore out I memorized every line of dialogue every scene and to this day when I see the cloud minders it is it's just like burned into my brain and like I said, it's not even that memorable of an episode. It's a season three episode, and season three was typically uh, thought of as a, the lesser of all the seasons. It's when the quality really kind of dropped off, and it was the last season of the show. But the Cloudminders uh, makes my list just because uh, it's it's permanently etched into my gray matter. What was the uh, plot of that one again? There, there's actually a, a cloud city. The, the this was you know ten years before Empire Strikes Back came out, but there's a cloud city, and they're on this planet, and it's uh it's kind of the typical like um, haves and haves versus not versus like the the people who are um, enlightened and wealthy they live in Stratos, which is the cloud city. And the the people who are the workers, they they work or down, on the miners down they're, below. They're right? the miners, yeah. Right, I remember that one. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's an odd episode because in one scene, if you know anything about Star Trek lore, uh, you don't talk about Pond Far with anybody. Pond Far is the is the Vulcan mating ritual, and you know in the episode Amok Time. Spock doesn't even want to talk to Kirk about it. He's like, it's just very personal, and you know, we don't talk about we don't talk about it with anyone. But in this episode, the Cloudminders, uh, Spock meets a very attractive woman who's dressed scantily, as all women in Star Trek were. It, he just met her, and they're just kind of hanging out, and and uh, he tells her about Pon Far. You only take a mate once every seven years. The seven-year cycle is biologically inherent in all Vulcans. At that time, the mating drive outweighs all other motivations. And is there nothing that can disturb that cycle, Mr. Spock? Extreme feminine beauty is always disturbing. Madam. It's very odd, like when put in context with everything else about Ponfar. It's just kind of. Well, sp- I mean, that's that's his ace in the hole. I mean, yeah. he's playing it right there. Yeah, he's like, his, he's like, listen. Yeah, it's been uh, almost seven years. <laughs> yeah, he's like, and I told you about Ponfar. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one thing I always thought was strange. And then, of course, we see Ponfar kind of played out in Star Trek Three a little bit with a bunch of screaming and yelling and finger touching. With Savick and Spock, but um, yeah, the Cloud Miners. Not not really any any super uh, amazing episode. Just one that I will never. I mean, I will never ever forget. So well, the thing about that was interesting too. Was the 
because they the haves looked down on the have nots because they read they looked at them as being inferior and it turned out like whatever they were mining was actually the reason they were so stupid yeah because it was uh it was the the dust in the the stuff they were mining that that like impeded their their mental growth so and then so you know of course kirk and spock come in and save the day and clear up their society and then they move on <laughs> kirk kirk makes a point to have the leader of cl- of the cloud city come down and mine the gas and he starts acting like an ape and he's like you see you see well, that's a great episode too where you really see the stunt doubles oh God. <laughs> something star trek is famous for man it's they, like they didn't even try to hide it. no yeah it's no. not even like a similar looking person <laughs> hey look the guy Hey, the Spock's stunt double is like African American, and <laughs> you know, must have got Ace Frehley's stunt double. Yeah, exactly. It's just, yeah, some of those fight scenes, and they just sit on these wide shots and just linger on, on the on the people, and it's like, oh man, are you kidding me? Can you you, you, you want to cut away from this because it's obviously it's almost like straight profiles of of the stunt double. Yeah, that's like somebody's Uncle John over there in Kirk's. Tunic. I mean, come on. So, yeah, stunt doubles on Star Trek is uh, it's pretty amusing. So, what do you got, Matt? My very favorite episode of all time, going into season two, was Mirror Mirror. Oh yes. And I, I don't know why this one was my favorite growing up, but it always was. And Mirror Mirror, if uh, you don't remember, was Kirk and crew. Uh, were on an away mission, and when they were beaming back up, there was a transporter malfunction, and they happened to reappear in an alternate dimension, and conversely, their counterparts in the other dimension appear in their home dimension, so everyone is uh, out of place, so Kirk, uh, all of a sudden, transported in, is not even in the same uniform, he's in like the shiny, sleeveless uniform. yes. Everyone's in like Ahura's in like the the cut off sexy outfit. And they've got the, all the daggers on. I, I love the daggers. I thought that was the the best part. I don't know why. And and of course Spock, evil Spock. He has a goatee, so you know he's evil Spock. Oh yes. Uh, starts to realize that there's something not right about his captain. And in this alternate universe, it's kind of customary to uh, to conspire against your leaders and to assassinate them. So uh, so that's what Kirk and and friends are, are up against the entire time. And then likewise, in the other universe, you have a... It takes a very, them like five seconds to figure out something's <laughs> wrong. You have a very angry Kirk and crew. Yeah. They're, they're like, just acting like pure savages. Yeah, they're all they're, locked up in the brig, like going, screaming I like banshees. <laughs> <laughs> Traitorous pig, I'll hang you up by your Vulcan ears. Are you all executed? I think not. Your authority on this ship is extremely limited, Captain. The four of you will remain here in the brig and in custody until I discover how to return you to wherever it is you belong. Has the whole galaxy gone crazy? What kind of a uniform is this? Where's your beer? What's going on? Where's my personal guard? I can answer none of your questions at this time. No, it's just the Spock and the universe are fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to spend more time with the evil people in the good universe to see exactly what that was all about. But I mean, there was no hiding them. They stood out like sore thumbs. <laughs> there was no, yeah. They couldn't even like act like normal people. They were just like savages. <laughs> there's yeah, there's no there's no pretending. Like So it. they had to, to find their way back uh, to their other universe and of course Spock in the end became their ally knowing that he didn't want them in his universe any more than they wanted to be there either. So, but uh, the stylized look of that episode, how cornily they change things to make it different. Yes, like Spock's goatee and the outfits, and Sulu with his uh, scar. He had the scar with the big scar. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun stuff in that episode. Mirror mirrors. It was a good departure, kind of from the the norm of that show. And don't forget the agonizer. Oh yeah. You have to hand it over, and then they stick it on your chest or something. It makes you scream and writhe around. Right. I remember that because they did a parody of that on Mystery Science Theater, where the 
Mike and the bots were their evil versions, and the bots had all let their agonizers battery die, <laughs> so they didn't work. <laughs> ah! They're like, did you let the battery die again? Uh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> that episode was was a lot of fun. It was. God, there's been so many. I don't know if Next Generation did, but didn't Voyager do a bunch of? Mirror no, Mirror? it was uh, Deep Space Nine. They, that's right. Deep they they went back to the mirror universe. Many. And it turned out Spock had failed or something like that. And yeah. Well. Evil. Yeah, because uh, he made he made the Federation weak because oh, he that's right. he that's preached right. uh, peace and and uh, so then all the Terrans, which were Earthlings, they all were became basically slave labor of the universe. So <laughs> so he basically enslaved. He was responsible for the enslavement of the entire Federation because he tried to uh, to steer it. Way to go, evil Spock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You take your goatee and ruin another universe. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, that was that was a fun episode, though, because, you, you know, you got to see a different side of those characters. Yeah, and it was fun. It was a fun one as a kid to watch. Oh, definitely, without a doubt. What do you got next, Mike? Well, actually, mine is from season three, and it's one of the ones I do remember distinctly seeing as a kid. It was really kind of disturbing, and I think it holds up as a good episode. It's it's um, Day of the Dove. Or, oh, with the uh, Klingons? Yeah, they beam down the planet, and the Klingons capture them, but then they trick the Klingons into beaming on their ship without their weapons, but they also bring this this alien energy form, mm-hmm. and what it does is it makes it turns all their weapons into swords, and like the whole... Like the episode is the Klingons fighting uh, the Federation on the Enterprise. And um, it was really like even watching as a kid, I mean, you know, it wasn't graphic, but still it didn't have to be like people were being stabbed with swords and stuff like that. So that was pretty like horrific. But then, you know, the, this entity was bringing them back to life so that they would be on this endless uh, cycle of just continuously fighting each other. But then it had this really great ending where, like, Kirk figured out what was going on. And so it's basically, they were, like, in, I think they're in engineering. And, uh, it like, they're all the Klingons and the Federation all just start laughing at this thing. Yes. To make it go to away. To make it shrink. Yeah. So, because it feeds <laughs> off their anger. Yes. And, uh, anyway, that was an episode that really stuck stuck out to me when I was a kid. And uh, I, I like it a lot. That episode, it really, it's uh, it's one of those original series episodes that that obviously features Klingons heavily, and the Klingons they change so much over the years. In, in this episode, you know the Klingons are literally guys and women painted brown. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it, they look greasy too. Oh yes, <laughs> they look Com- so greasy. completely <laughs> greasy. That's that's a good way of putting it. I, I like that. Uh, I think his name was Kang, the the Klingon who was uh, he's played by Michael Ansara, who 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 had acted in a lot of stuff. Also, the husband of Barbara Eden, uh, of the I Dream of Genie fame. I don't know why I know that, but I do. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> random. <laughs> but um, you know, Michael Ansara, he came back. Years later, in Deep Space Nine, and played Kang again, along with looking like that too, right? No, no, he looked like uh, they gave uh, him the ridges. They they, he, they had the modern. It, it was him, John Colicos, who was the first Klingon introduced on right. the show, and uh, William Campbell, who was Koloth, who was in the Trouble with Tribbles, and they brought them all back in a couple of Deep Space Nine episodes, and they were you know aging warriors and uh it was kind of interesting but uh they did de- at some point was it in deep space nine where Worf there was like a little quip about how they don't talk about why well, they, that's the episode where they go back to in time to the terrible tribble episode y- yes yes yeah. and they had to address that obviously because that's the what Klingons it was right. in that episode didn't have the foreheads <laughs> and he goes yes they are Klingons and we do not because talk they're all about like, it. like they're like where's the Klingons? Where's I know, but I love how they explain it. They explain it by saying we don't talk I know, about it. I know. He's like, and that was all goes, you needed to hear. He's like, wait, those are Klingons? They are Klingons, and it is a long story. What happened? Some kind of genetic engineering? A viral mutation? 
We do not discuss it with outsiders. <laughs> because they're, you know, they're just dudes painted brown. <laughs> it was a very smart way of getting around it. Yeah, I remember that uh, that the day of the dove, uh, and at the end, you know, he like hits Kirk on the back as they're laughing at the. Uh, I, I, that's one thing I do remember. Like he, they're they're both laughing, and then Kang like S- smacks, smacks him, him on the back, the back, and you know Shatner gives like a, "Hey, buddy, what are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Mine. I think this is probably one of Mike's favorites, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, The Galileo 7. Uh, The Galileo 7 is a season one episode, and it involves uh, Spock and Scotty and McCoy and some some other randoms uh, crashing. It's another episode where his Vulcan, Vulcan mannerisms gets him into hot water. And they're all pissed at him. Yeah, because he's just he, doing logic. He's yes. trying to do logic the whole time. Well, they they end up crashing this shuttlecraft on this planet. It's a hostile world. There's there's native life there that is not friendly. The nameless crew members start getting picked off <laughs> pretty quickly. And uh, the whole time, back on the Enterprise, Kirk, there's kind of a ticking clock because there's this jerk ambassador <laughs> which they have to get medical supplies somewhere like in every ambassador from the federation in star trek is a jerk like that's just like that's a universal that's a universal truth of that show oh look it's ambassador what's his name he's going to be a big jerk this week <laughs> so this this guy's like we've got to get those medical supplies kirk you've got two hours and he's like i'm gonna search until the last minute so the Enterprise is going to have to abandon them if they if they can't find them, and so uh, they search for them, but they don't, uh, you know, they don't find the, the missing shuttle. And in the meantime, you know, crew members under Spock's command keep getting picked off and dying. And McCoy is is really being a jerk to Spock throughout the whole ordeal, just like where's your Vulcan logic now, Spock? <laughs> you know, and. Man, was, was Spock ever accountable for losing all of those people? No, he lost half his crew, and he's like, everything's fine when they find him. Everybody's really down on Spock because, like Mike said, he's just he's relying on his logic and not really anything else, and it's not really serving him very well. He doesn't get that the savages attacking the shuttle, they don't behave according to logic, and it it really throws him for a loop. Which, which yeah, especially considering that poor schmo he left out there to guard here you stay here <laughs> we're going back to the shuttle <laughs> that guy had a lifespan of yeah like minutes. yeah exactly i think uh i think it's a growth episodes for spock i think uh after that episode he wasn't so rigid in his thinking uh because it, well yeah because at the last minute he did something completely illogical <clears throat> yes he uh he ignited they've somehow made it into space they got the shuttle up off the ground and into orbit. And as a last-ditch effort, he uses the remaining fuel and ignites it, sending up a flare, hoping the Enterprise will see it. And, of course, they do see it. McCoy's like, well, why did you do that, Spock? Or something like that. And, you know, you see Spock is starting to embrace more of his uh, human side and not relying so much on logic. But that is, I, I don't know why, it's always been my favorite Star Trek episode ever. I think, the again, the remastering that we've talked about really served this episode well. It really made a lot of the shots uh, really cinematic looking and really added a lot. Didn't, didn't detract, but uh, they didn't stand out and like, oh, look at me. It just made it like a, a, great, a great viewing experience. So it wasn't it wasn't obvious it it, it worked itself well into the, the Well show. no I mean obviously the the effects you are seeing uh the the well, one of the things is they're in this big nebula and in the the original show it looked like some you know food coloring and cotton balls but <laughs> it it looked like a legit nebula in the remastered show and right. um it made it look you know just cool and I I like that well, I think it's a good episode just because of the situation they're in. You know, like they have to barricade themselves in the shuttle, and 
It's a, it's kind of like a really scary episode. It's almost like a siege episode, you know, like Night Living Dead, that type of thing. Yeah, because they're what, what, being attacked. But the f- one thing I really liked is they're sending the shuttles down. <laughs> they're like looking at the re- them reporting in, and they're all like their clothes are torn, and they're all dirty looking, and they're like, yes. If they've if they've encountered the inhabitants, they're done for. <laughs> yes, that's true. But uh, yeah, that's that's always been my favorite, still to this day. So so many good ones. I mean, Star Trek. I mean, was it eighty episodes that they put out there? Yeah, There's so many good ones. Seventy nine, but eighty, 79. I guess, if you count the cage. I do count the cage. Okay, cage is a good episode. But uh, we'll we'll come back and revisit more of our our favorite episodes. Oh, There's yeah. just so much good stuff to talk about here. But uh, but Star Trek, we uh, we'll definitely be giving Star Trek a lot more love on this this show. Absolutely, We've got a lot a lot of requests to to work a lot more Star Trek in. So we're gonna we're gonna do it, guys. We are. We we're gonna make it so. Ha <laughs> ha! You see? See what? It, make it so. Okay. Genius. <laughs> Shut up. Thank you for joining us this week as we took a look into the 23rd century. (laughs) For us, the past. For you guys, the future, of course. But uh, come back here next week. We've got a lot of uh, interesting stuff in the works we think you're going to really enjoy. Oh, yeah. Stay safe, wash your hands, and keep listening to the one and only podcast on the Internet. Go back and re-listen to old shows if you haven't, because we know you haven't. (laughs) Do it. Do it. Uh, We'll see you next week. See you guys. You know you can't live without this content, so subscribe to The Hyperspace, podcasting in the 25th century. Follow us on social media, leave us a review, and join us here next time as we take you into the 25th century.